questions and ops uh, part. So there, this will be more theoretical part. So we, the idea or the goal of this session is end of this session, you know, you understand what are the options you have available to do the uh, integration with uh, finance and operations. So let me go to the, the agenda for the today. So brief introduction about myself and the topics we will be covering is the integration overview, uh, the integration options you have from finance and operation, then integration practices and how to secure the integration. And if time permits, we will go through a little bit about how uh, monitoring and alerting can be set up for your integration and the release management uh, practices for uh, deploying um, integrations. About myself, uh, Pooja Jain, I'm working as an integration architect for HSO, uh, which is a company based in Utrecht. Uh, we are focusing on uh, Azure integrations and Dynamics products. Um, yeah, I mainly focus on Azure integration, security, DevOps, and .NET development. Um, there's a blog uh, which I yeah, frequently write about uh, the tips and tricks for integrations and the finance and operation integration best practices. So if you guys have any yeah, questions after this, and if you have doubt, you can always follow my blog, azureintegrations.com. Thank you. Uh, I live in Utrecht. I'm from uh, India, uh, relocated to yeah, Netherlands for a couple of years already. I've, I've worked on uh, for Microsoft, Avanade, and Capture 9 past. That's all about me. Uh, just going to the integration overview. I hope most of you guys know about D365 Finance and Operations. It is a SaaS solution from Microsoft for Enterprise Resource Planning. Um, so I'm not going too much detail into that, but uh, before going to integrations, I just want you guys to be aware of few terms we will come across in the presentation. The most important uh, term is data entity. What is a data entity? So what happens in finance and operation is all the data is stored in a table. Uh, let's consider a scenario about a customer. So you have a customer called Shell. Uh, you have information about Shell. Then who is the, the address of uh, the office of Shell, for example, and then what is the electronic address and other details. So all these informations are normalized and uh, kept in a small table in a physical um, data storage in uh, SQL, for example. But let's say when you are doing the integration, what ideally you would need is a generic information. An example would be, I want to know all the customers which uh, we have stored in finance and operation, for example. And we don't want to then query each and every normalized table. Instead, Microsoft has built something called data entity, uh, which is, you can consider as a view which on built on top of these normalized table in SQL, which is more than a view, but uh, on a high level to understand. So we can call a entity to get the information which we require. So that's the concept. Then let's go deeper into the integration overview for finance and operation. It provides a um, number of endpoints to perform integrations uh, and based on what you use, uh, what is your use case, you need to pick the right um, integration options. Just because there is yeah, an integration option doesn't mean that it fits for a particular use case. So it is very crucial that yeah, you understand the use case and then pick the right integration options. So how a data is stored in finance and operation? It's stored in a SQL database. And of course, uh, since it's a SaaS solution, you will never have access to a, uh, a SQL database of finance and operation. The only way Microsoft will expose that data is using data entity. Data entity is built using custom business logic, um, relations between tables, and that uh, entity is the only entry point where you can fetch the information from finance and operation. 
And what are the integration options we have? We have OData, which is most standard one. You can fetch information from finance and operation using OData. Then we have DMF, a data management framework. I'll get come to that in detail later. And then we have something called bring your own database, which is to copy the data from your uh, SQL database into an on-premise or to an uh, Azure SQL database. And other options are custom web services, which is can be accessed using REST or SOAP web service. And then for event-based uh, uh, pattern, we have something called business event. A good example is, let's say you got a purchase order. A purchase order was confirmed, and then you need to let the warehouse know that, okay, please send these purchase orders. Then there is something called business event. There are out-of-the-box business events, which can actually trigger integrations. It could be a service purse. It could be an event grid, logic app, uh, or Azure functions. You can trigger these events and then you can fetch additional information from uh, finance and operation. So let's look at yeah, where does uh, um, these integration ops uh, integration option fit in? So uh, I normally divide uh, our integration use case into two categories. One is like real time or near real time integrations, and the other one is the batch um, uh, integration whenever you want to export data into large volume. So let's say you want to um, yeah have a near real time integration for smaller amount of data. Then you have four options. One is to use all data endpoint. All data, for example, let's say I want to know whether a stock um, I'm ordering an item from Amazon.com. I, I want to check whether the yeah the item I'm ordering is available when you enter the site. Then ideally I would use something called a near real time integration. Then let's say finance and operation is exposing the stock information via or data, then I would call the or data endpoint and see whether the item is in stock or not before users can actually uh, make an order. Now, uh, or data provides most of the entities, but there would be um, use cases where you need a custom logic to expose from finance and operation. Uh, a good example would be a smart price calculator. Um, what you see is, let's say uh, you are ordering a uh, ticket from um, any site for flights. You see that as people order more and more seats, the pricing of the uh, ticket gets expensive. How does that work? Because yeah, they have a smart pricing calculator engine built in on their uh, platform, which actually based on the usage and uh, peak uh, in the traffic, it increases the price of the tickets, for example. So in that, uh, case you need a custom uh, business logic uh, built in, then you make use of a custom web service in finance and operation, which can be accessed uh, using um, any integration platforms. The next one is the business event, uh, an ideal use case for eventing pattern. When something has happened in your finance and operation, you want to perform an action based on that. You can't keep on querying a finance and operation because that's going to be an expensive integration. Polling is always expensive. Instead, what you want to do is event-based uh, integration. Whenever something has happened in finance and operation, you want to get notified. And based on that notification, you need to perform operation. Uh, for example, let's say you got a purchase order. You um, your company has approved it in finance and operation. Now you want to send that information to all the partners, for example, uh, to truck management, to warehouse, to another application. Then you get the notification and then uh, you route that notification to your partners. So it's an ideal use case for a business event. Less known is business alert. You can also set a custom alert and then push endpoint um, haven't used much but yeah um, it can be used for uh, typical integration scenarios now 
real time, let's say you want to populate data into finance and operation, you can use more data using a post method or patch to update. So what do you do is, yeah, uh, let's say in Amazon, I placed, uh, uh, I ordered five shoes. I want that information immediately available in my finance and operation. Then I place that order in uh, uh, finance and operation using all data. Similarly, custom web service can also populate data. So these are the options you use near real time and your data volume is not high. Uh, for higher amount of volume, you should never use any of these um, integration patterns except uh, business end. You should stick to the batching operation. That's mainly because th there is a um, restriction built by Microsoft called priority based routing. I'll come to that uh, in a bit, but you need to be yeah, aware of what priority based routing is. Then large volume of data, you want to send it to other system or populate it to finance and operation. Then you have um, mainly uh, four options for exporting data. Um, data management framework, which allows you to export data using any file format, XML, CSV, Excel. So it provides a framework to actually uh, export bulk amount of data. Then a uh, little bit advanced version of um, DMF is called recurring integration. It is part of uh, uh, DMF framework itself, but it provides a queuing mechanism. An ideal example is let's say every day you want to export your uh, general ledger or, or all the purchase order or information about your warehouse to a third party application. Then what you do is you set up something called recurring integration, which will automatically run um, once in a day and it will export the data out of finance and operation. Then you build integration to download those information and send it to the third party applications. So what it provides is a queuing mechanism or scheduling mechanism to export data from uh, finance and operation. The next um, uh, I think most commonly used one is Beyond, uh, bring your own database. What it does is it allows you to copy your data from um, a full database into an external database. Currently, it's only supported for Azure SQL database, but then you can have a data replication mechanism to copy that data into anywhere else. Beyond is ideally used for Power BI, or let's say you want to copy the whole data um, into application like Slim for, then you make use of uh, Beyond. Caution, uh, Beyond is going to get retired very soon. It is going to get replaced something called Azure Data Lake, uh, mainly because of performance uh, issues. Beyond is um, runs on finance and operation on AOS and batch server. It has a performance uh, impact. So Microsoft has built and uh, brought in a new technique uh, using Azure Data Lake and Synapses to replicate the functionality of PR. I'll come to that um, in a bit. The next one is importing data into finance and operation. Um, a similar use case, let's say, um, your company has a lot of partners. They do the sales transactions for you. And end of the day, you want to import all the sales transactions back to finance and operation. What is the ideal use case? That would be your DMF. You can either use XML or uh, CSV, similar to export mechanism. You can use any template which is supported by finance and operation and import that data back to FO. And similarly, you can also have a scheduling mechanism for importing that is using the current integration. That's yeah, in high level, we, what we're going to talk about um, today and then a little bit of pros and cons of each of these integrations. Let's start with um, near real time integration. I, as I mentioned, there are uh, three techniques we can mainly use here, OData, custom web service, and business even. To get the data into finance and operation, we use either OData or custom web service. This is ideal for small amount of data because um, 
if there is a lot of data, what you are doing is you are also bringing down the performance of finance and operation for end users. But for Microsoft, keeping end user experience is the most important part of providing a SaaS solution. Integration gets treated like a second citizen. That's mainly because, yeah, that's not their revenue. Revenue is uh, end user license and they want to keep the end users happy. So what they have built in is um, a security measures that, yeah, these integration endpoints don't bring down the system performance. So they built in something called priority based throttling. So whenever there is huge performance impact, either created by integration or it is uh, something which is happening in their own FNO system, then they would say that, OK, only integration which has highest priority can be executed now. All others will get um, stopped. So when you're building an integration, it is very important to keep in this in mind. Otherwise, your integrations will stop working and build a retry mechanism to make sure that, yeah, even if finance and operation is uh, busy and rejecting to, to throttling exception, you can retry them later. So that's one of the, yeah, I think pitfall when you use a near uh, real time integration. So to uh, put data in, as long as the number of transactions are less, use all data endpoint and custom web services to fetch the data out of finance and operation, all data, custom web services, and business if event, ideal for the eventing platform. So keep in mind it's for limited amount of transactions. And the next one we talked in detail, um, which is the DMR framework. DMR framework was built in to perform batch operations. The large amount of data going out and into finance and operation needs to be done using DMF. I don't think there is any other option you have. All the bulk operation, please use a data management framework. So there are um, four um, API you will get. One is to import data into FNO using DMF framework. So that is using DMF on demand uh, import or export. A good example is, let's say you have set of purchase order on your hand and you want to initiate the import right now. Then what you make use is the import API, which will you will see and then you check the status of the importing job and then um, if it's successful, you would get the um, information back from finance and operation. Next one is the scheduling based uh, every night, uh, 12 o'clock or uh, 6 in the morning. You want to import data into finance and operation. Then you have recurring integration for which you uh, you make use of another API called NQ API, which allows you to um, queue the integration for recurring integration. Similarly, uh, you have export API, DQ API. Concept is similar. Whenever you want to do something on, on demand, use the package API. Then make large export during business hours. Always keep your batch job if it's not resource intensive um, outside the business um, hours. Just to ensure that yeah, users are not impacted by your integrations. Going a little bit in detail into our data endpoint. So it supports like or any other uh, or data standard. It supports uh, post, patch, put, get, and delete. And um, delete is something I wouldn't recommend to use in FNO uh, because FNO is system of records. You want to keep the uh, 
for, for auditing purpose, you want to keep the data in FNO. Instead of deleting it, what you could do is you can disable or deactivate that um, uh, product or record. So uh, one thing it does is, let's say you're fetching the data, it has a page size limit of um, 1000. You cannot get more than that, then you need to implement a paging mechanism. Um, like any other old data, it supports uh, filtering of the data, for example, to get all the purchase order as a number X, Y, Z, then you can use the filtering, count, order by. All these are supported, but what is not yet supported is the nesting of expand. Uh, most of the other platform support, but finance and operation doesn't support nesting of expand statements yet. Um, then um, filtering options um, similar. Then there is a concept of legal entity in finance. So by default, any query you do using OData is runs on the context of the integration account. Let's say you have a legal entity for NL, you have a legal entity for UK, and your integration account is defaulted to um, NL. Then all the operations you do using um, core data is actually only for NL. But ideally, you want integration to be legal entity independent because, in the end, finance operation is a one system which you want to fetch or uh, um, yeah, put information into. So it supports something called cross company. When you in the query string, when you say that, okay, cross company equals true then you can perform all these operations across um, across the legal entity. I, I don't recommend using the default finance and operation connector. For me, it's a primitive connector. Um, it doesn't support a lot of uh, flexibility, especially when you want to update data and execute actions on cross uh, company level, then it doesn't support. And performance wise also, I don't recommend using um, out of the box, yeah, finance connector. Always use HTTP connector if it's possible. It's performant, it is advanced, and you can do more with uh, um, HTTPS connector than finance and operation connector. Then bring your own database. Um, this is ideal for all the Power BI uh, stuff and to export data into maybe like your on premise system requires data from finance and operation. Want to, yeah, use anything else and do a data replication um, from yeah, uh, cloud to on premise. How does it uh, work? You create an Azure SQL database. Then um, it, under DMF, there is a configuration for um, export option for entities. You set up a connection for um, the SQL DB, then go to the entity store and publish the entity. Uh, when you publish the entity, what happens is it creates a table or schema in your Azure SQL. After that, you can actually perform the export of data into your database. Of course, you don't want to, um, if you want this integration to run, you don't want to go and click middle of the night. So that's where recurring integration comes in. You can just uh, set up a schedule saying that, okay, either run every six hours or middle of the night, and then it will do the export uh, nightly. The new guy in the town is uh, Azure Data Link. If you guys are using a lot of beyond, I would highly recommend start looking into this feature. Um, at least from the course, what I've understood is that yeah, in near future, they want to start uh, yeah, retire beyond and start using Azure Data Lake, mainly because of performance. Whoever has used beyond on a large scale, they all have gone through the performance issue and uh, sometimes failing export jobs, which they have come across. So an ideal option for that is to take the load out of finance and operation and do that outside 
AOS server, and one of the mechanisms they came up with is uh, Azure Data Lake. What is the difference it does on the uh, export side is it doesn't run on your AOS server, but it makes use of SQL replication technique. So it doesn't put any burden on your um, finance and operation, but it goes uh, um, yeah, beneath that um, SQL storage level, which brings in a lot of advantage for yeah, end user experience and um, issues with uh, performance. So what it does is you have two kinds of export you can configure. You can say that OK, export uh, full or, or you can also enable something called uh, incremental push. So any minor changes you do on the data, it can actually push it um, as it happens. They uh, yeah, say it would take up to 10 minutes to do that replication, um, but it is still yeah much better than um, doing PR. And with this option, uh, I would also start using uh, data like for integration options, mainly because yeah, we at least can say that if the data is less than th 13 minutes old, if it's that if that is fine to for target applications, then take all the complexity of, of uh, finance and operations. So the performance is optimal there and start using data lake as your um, source information and try to send them from a data lake. So when you enable data lake, what you would get is CSVs for entities. For example, all the accounts, all the um, customers, all the purchase order, all the sales order, all of them start appearing and uh, either on the table level or on the entity level in data lake as a CSV file. But it is still not uh, replicating your database or be bring your own database. So what Microsoft is doing in preview is uh, you can have an event grid on data lake. Whenever a change becomes it, which is the incremental push, uh, you can use an Azure function to get those changes and then update um, your uh, um, yeah, SQL using synapses. So you can have a data pipeline to fetch the change field and push that information into SQL. And this option can also be used as Power BI because it supports um, all the storage related. Um, um, if it requires CSV, it can get the CSV or it can also plug into your um, exported database to do the Power BI related um, reports. So that's those are the integration options what we have. But yeah, just because there is an endpoint doesn't mean it's an open endpoint. It is it is a secure environment, so you can build additional uh, security on top of your API as well. So currently uh, we use Azure AD based authentication to get the endpoint uh, data. The example would be what you would do is you would register an Azure AD application and then on the Azure AD application you grant permission to perform operations on finance and operation. So that's on the API permission level for the Azure AD application. And once you register that uh, application, you get the client ID and um, client secret that you give to the third party application which wa wants to communicate with finance and operation. And in finance and operation, you give a fine grain permission uh, to access the data. So make sure that, yeah, just because you registered in Azure AD, don't give an admin access. Make sure to give a fine grain permission. Always follow the least permission model required just to make sure that yeah, your data is not exposed and uh, doesn't end up in uh, uh, places where you don't want to. So how would you get access to it? So you using the client ID and um, client secret, your request for the access token and all the requests you make to finance an operation endpoint, you add the master bearer token and then it will be authenticated. So that's regarding, yeah, um, finance and operation integration patterns. Um, but then also when you are building integration, you need to make sure that yeah, you, you have an integration design pattern. Uh, an example would be, I always try to build loosely coupled integration. 
what I mean by loosely coupled integration is when something happens in a source system, in this case, let's say financial operation, I want to send the information to another application or also to another database, for example, like Slim for or um, Locus, any other um, application. You don't want to have a point to point integration. Uh, why? Because it could be that when you're sending the data, the target applications are not available or there was an issue with the network connectivity. So you do want that information to be lost. So what you want to do, you want to have a loosely coupled target. You introduce a Azure service bus or any queuing mechanism to make sure that you, whenever there is something needs to be sent, store them in your service bus and then if you require this information to be sent across multiple systems, from, then build the integration in such a way that you read the messages from a service bus, put them in a topic, and then uh, uh, yeah, then send those information to the target application. So even if the target application is down, um, at least as a service bus gives a option to retry automatically. So you can try up to 10 times, uh, you can set that um, configuration. Then hope, let, let's hope that then yeah, those 10 retries, the integration is succeed. If it, let's say the system as was down for a complete day, you can't keep on retrying forever uh, because that's going to cost your integration a um, lot of money as well. So what it does is it that message goes to the dead letter queue, then build a monitoring mechanism to uh, not Notify your um, support organization to yeah um, come and check this dead letter queue and uh, have an automated mechanism to resubmit these dead letter messages back uh, to the service bus queue when the target systems are available. So that's an ideal yeah use case for loosely coupled integration, but not always it works. An example would be point to point communication. Let's say you want to check immediately what is the status of an order, then you can't have a loosely coupled integration there. So then, yeah, you tend to use the point to point, but otherwise always try to use the decoupled uh, or loosely coupled integration. And within the, this approach, what is the benefit is that yeah, we can also apply rate limiting. Uh, I think one of the um, scenario Sandro discussed was, let's say there was parallelism or um, something similar to that in your logic app. You could theoretically take the target application down because you are sending so many requests. Uh, example would be, let's say there was a data migration is happening to finance and operation. So much data now you need to send at once to your target applications that could potentially yeah, disrupt these uh, systems. So you uh, so you won't have kind of rate limiting saying that, okay, please send these requests like yeah, 50 requests per minute or um, 100 requests per uh, minute. So this particular architecture would give you that yeah, freedom and capability to apply the API rate limiting. Then, Next one I always yeah, do at least in my integration is my, I'll make my integration item, but what it means is if I resubmit the same message again, it doesn't create duplicate on the target system. For example, let's say, um, yeah, I'm sending a purchase order. I send the purchase order, but I didn't get a response from a target application, but the target application has successfully processed that message. Of course, I got the failure and then I retry the message again and then it goes and creates a duplicate purchase. Order. That is not something you want to have in your integration. Always make sure your integration, if it resubmits 10 times, it doesn't create 10 records. It just creates one record. So mostly you use absurd. That's an ideal yeah, scenario you should always uh, do it. You should check whether a record exists. If it exists, update the record. But yeah, always check whether it exists before adding a new record. So that's uh, what happens is most of the time is yeah, you would see that a lot of integration is failing. And 
most of the support organization like try to resubmit that and then they see that okay there are duplicate uh, records on the target application but if you build that yeah a bit smarter make it item potent then uh, yeah the support organization organization can resubmit those messages either from the integration side or from finance and operation and then yeah it doesn't cause a data uh, uh, duplication then uh, another pattern I use um, because most of the time, yeah, you, your uh, finance and operation requires data to be pushed to your on-premise system or get the information from on-premise system. Since yeah, yeah, T365 is a SaaS solution, but still most of the applications, legacy applications are on their on-premise system. I use two patterns to connect that there are multiple patterns uh, on the infrastructure level. You can create VPNs and things, but that requires a lot of changes on the uh, customer infrastructure. For that, Microsoft has given two options. One, you build an Azure Data Gateway, or you build hybrid connection or Azure Relay. So what is the benefit of that? It's just a software component you install. It builds the secure tunnel. And then you can access the data from on premise. Um, let's consider Azure Data Gateway. You can uh, access the on premise file system. You can even access the on premise SQL server. Let's say you have an AX 2009 or AX 2012 running. You need a hybrid approach because some of the information still you want to be yeah, doing in AX 2009. Um, then you can use, uh, yeah. Uh, Azure Data Gateway to access those web services and have an interaction. Most of the data migration options or like a platform upgrade options, you don't do a big bang, uh, yeah, uplifting of your AX uh, platform. You do per business release, which means that yeah, per business release, you still need um, intermediate integration, which communicates with uh, AX as well as with uh, finance and operation, like a data synchronization. So in both scenarios, yeah, try to, if you don't have any uh, infrastructure where you can access your on-premise system in cloud, make use of, make use of your yeah, on-premise data get for your uh, relay functionality. Then yeah, any of your integration uh, has to be secure. Um, I think especially these days, you need to put extra effort and investment in securing your integration because everyone is working remote. You don't want any data leak. Uh, before, yeah, you were within your uh, organization, so you could have condition access policy, all that to restrict access to your information. Now, since it's publicly available, so um, make your APIs more and more secure. Uh, make use of modern authentication and always put your uh, integration behind a black box. For me, that black box is API management. So what I always do, whether it's an Azure function or a logic app I'm using, I always enable Azure AD authentication on these applications, on these endpoints. So, um, um, yeah. Azure Function supports um, uh, Azure AD integration. Uh, what um, uh, Logic App provides, I'm talking about the consumption base, it uh, provides the authorization so you can actually do a JWT token validation on your um, uh, HTTP based uh, Logic App to make sure that it's not publicly available. Uh, sorry, it is publicly available, but at least you make sure that those API endpoint is secured using or token and if it's possible if you have a premium um, API management then you have a static IP for that API management and then say that yeah your integration your endpoint only uh, receives the request from API management I'll come a little bit in detail of API management because that's something yeah I would really focus on an organization session which is actually exposing the data. Next one is uh, yeah, whenever you're building an integration, invest money in monitoring and alerting. That's mainly because most of the organizations 
all these integrations with finance and operations are business critical. You're building a lot and a lot of integration. You want to see the health of your integration. You want to see how long each integration is taking. You want to see what are the failures which is happening. And you also want to be notified. Uh, rather than being a reactive organization, always be a proactive organization. Try to build uh, extensive monitoring. Uh, try to build extensive alerting. An example would be, let's say, you are trying to create a purchase order or you're trying to create a customer, but the data is incorrect. Then there is nothing an integration can do to fix those uh, errors. It has to be fixed on the source system or um, by a functional consultant. Then when an integration fails, have an overview where um, it shows how the integrations are working. Also able to send an exact error message on an integration failure. So what I always do in my integration design is all my log errors goes to Azure Log Analytics. And I also have a custom error handling for each logic apps because logic apps uh, try catch functionality doesn't really give the exact error messages. But Sanjo said that, yeah, there are mechanisms to actually get the exact error messages from your logic app, for example. Put them in your log analytics. Use a custom table in log analytics. Even if you're using Azure Functions or um, logic app, always log the information and then use uh, uh, promoted properties in your logic app to have that uh, yeah, specific information about that failure. Um, for example, purchase order. You want to know in your um, yeah, exception, the exception is happened for this particular purchase order. Most of the time, yeah, you don't get that information, so you can not promote a property. That was a shape on the track properties, sorry. Uh, now use track properties to get that uh, unique information about that integration so that yeah, um, a functional consultant or the support organization can find out that this particular uh, yeah, integration for this record has been failed. It's a little bit hard if you don't log that information and build a nice dashboard where uh, someone can come and view how the integrations are work. An example here is um, we have a critical work order management system and here it shows how the integration is running. Are there a lot of failures? Uh, is the health of the integration is good and is it taking more than expected time to actually finish these uh, integrations? So these are all out of the box uh, metrics given by Logic Hub, for example. So you don't have to invest a lot of time. It is like quick win for any organization which is using these um, dashboards. And then I my favorite tool when I use Logic Hub is the Logic Hub management solution. It gives such a nice overview of yeah, how are the integrations running, which integration is uh, failing, and then I can filter to four hours, eight hours, and um, up to 30 days. And then by logging these track properties, I can also like look at the error and see, okay, for this particular purchase order, the integration has been failed. So invest time in building, monitoring, and alerting for your integration. Okay, and then API management. I recommend even hiding your finance and the operations um, URL under an API management. Uh, for me, API management is the door to your organization. You want to secure anything goes in and out of your organization using Azure API management. And if you are a global organization using your yeah, traffic manager and other additional securities on top of API management, but bare minimum implement an Azure API manager. It doesn't have to be I, uh, Azure API manager, use IBM API Connect, any other two, but a, a door through which yeah, people can enter 
uh, and it posts your information. So for me, that is the API management. So all your API always goes through your API management and you sub, uh, accept information uh, or request only from API management. Try to build that into your integration patterns. And uh, then what you can do is, let's say, it, uh, suddenly one of the uh, yeah, country uh, gave this action um, to Iran. And now you don't want any people from uh, Iran to access the content, for example. Then what you can do is you can apply all these conditional access policies through API management saying that, okay, if the IP range comes from this particular IP range, block it. Don't let the request coming into our organization. And much more yeah, uh, policies can be applied through API management. So keep your API management is the doorway to your uh, data and build more and more secure security policies on top of API management. I think the next session after this, it, I think it's about the securing integration. I I hope yeah, you will learn more about that. So um, I think I recommend following that session as well because you need to make yeah, your APIs always secure. Um, before, yeah, I, um, like four years ago, the only way I could actually uh, make my logic up secure was using IP filtering. And IP filtering is fine, but you can also do IP spoofing. So what I would always uh, suggest nowadays is uh, use the authorization given by um, logic up and buy a premium plan uh, for your API management, have a static IP, and make sure that yeah, um, your logic app or Azure function accepts only requests from your API management. And API management also provides a lot more other uh, benefits, like it provides rate limiting. You don't want your integration to be uh, impacted by denial of service attack. So what you could do is, yeah, you can build down um, um, yeah, uh, API rate limiting. You can also sometimes uh, uh, cache the backend uh, responses, makes your integration a bit uh, faster. I think that those are the topics, and now if people have any questions, I can actually go through them. Thank you, Pujit. I have to say, you covered some very, very, very uh, crucial components when it comes to FNO uh, and interacting with with the tables for integrations uh, as well as the options available. So huge, huge thank you uh, for doing that. Uh, there is um, there is a question by Pillai who's asking: Is conditional policies good in this scenario, or creating a subscription model country wise a good practice? Yeah, so the uh, thing is mostly you use SPN based integrations uh, authentication, right? So you cannot really apply conditional access policy there. Uh, I would always use token based uh, validation and subscription management as well. Um, a good example is you're uh, getting an information from multiple application for your same API. Um, then what you can say is, OK, I, I'm going to give you a subscription key for application X, but then I found out that application X is uh, trying to yeah, bring down our integration. Then directly in our API management, I can delete that subscription key, and then he, uh, I don't have to accept any request coming from application X. So subscription management, I would highly recommend using it. Excellent, Pujit. OK, so we still have five minutes for any questions, so please feel free to drop them in the chat. There is a question by Ian Waring saying, very good. Um, on API integrations, we find Microsoft uh, changes the IP address, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So how do you get around that? Yeah, I think that question is for Beard, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's, yeah, that's one part I'm still struggling, to be honest, because what you do and bring your own database, you are exporting a lot of data out of your platform. And the only yeah, kind of security you get is the IP filtering. 
um, on your database. But since it's a dynamic IP, yeah, we always face that challenge. But what we do uh, do is um, um, check on the um, IP of our uh, finance and operation and see it's working. And if it doesn't work, we build a monitoring or the alerting mechanism to let us know that the IP range has changed. But other than that, yeah, I really don't have an option. That's also something we are struggling with, but that's good thing is it's going away. So yeah, I think uh, yeah. we we are in a yeah, safe place. Can I see uh, a question regarding, switch. yeah, go sorry. Ahead. Yeah, I saw a question regarding um, dual rate, uh, dual right. I didn't cover that topic mainly because that's, yeah, for me, it's not an integration. It's integration between CE and FO. Um, that's a Microsoft product. And uh, uh, yeah, you don't really need a customization or AIS component to do anything there. It's all configuration done on the Power Platform. So I didn't uh, take that part into consideration. It's ideal for CE uh, for integration, but if you are, yeah, uh, if you go through that proof of concept, you will find a lot of limitations in dual right, especially when it's custom entities and address book. But I'm not an expert on the dual right, so I, I think yeah, you should ask someone who is an expert on dual right. Thanks, Bridget. There's a question by Zoltan who's asking, what are the options if you need to implement a high amount of, um, sorry, if you want to implement a high amount of real-time integration, i.e. a travelling salesman with a mobile device uh, that needs uh, feedback uh, from FNO, such as an order number. Such as an order number. I, yeah. Uh, for now, we, you are restricted to use O data. Uh, but what some organisation does is, uh, what they do is they export the data into PR on an hourly fashion and then they expose the data uh, from your uh, bring your own database. Then you don't have this limitations on um, your API, yeah, rate limiting and priority based order. But doing that data refresh has an impact on your performance. But if you don't have a issue with lag in your data, then you can use uh, SQL as your uh, intermediate store to expose the data. Otherwise, for near real time, you have to use um, um, O data. But what you could do is you divide your integration into business critical integrations. So what finance and operation now it's got priority based throttling. So you integration X has pri highest priority. My integration Y has medium and integration Z has the low priority. So what happens is the as the, the CPU utilization and memory utilization of FNO goes higher and higher, then your low priority gets throttled first. Then comes to your medium priority integration and then comes to the highest priority. So uh, based on the business criticality of your integration, um, assign those priority. Use different accounts for integrations. Um, you can assign priority for an integration account. So try to use more and more uh, integration accounts rather than using a generic account for doing all the things. That would be my advice. Great stuff. OK. Um, so there are a few comments here. Um, Amid is saying very useful tips. Um, he's saying that he's used the data import framework in one solution. He wishes Microsoft build something similar for dynamic CE or Dataverse. Um, uh, not my topic, sorry. I'm not an expert on uh, CE. Uh, my focus is finance and operation. And Benjamin is saying, why not use dual right to give the sales guy a power app that looks up the data in Dataverse instead of D365? Um, so again, Benjamin uh, and I, Pujit, um, I think Pujit has already mentioned that he's obviously you know not too much of an expert on dual right, but I guess the benefit, uh, Benjamin, uh, what you're mentioning there is that uh, yes, that I, that dual right is designed to be. Uh, synchronous integration and uh, so that could work in that scenario 
um, if you needed more for real time integration. But I think this is I think the point of contention that a lot of people that don't realize about it for no one, I think Pujit is the, really the man around this is around the fact that there are challenges There's the, for every FNO, every FNO implementation I've seen has performance challenges, um, particularly yeah. around different types of transactions and integrations. And we have to be extremely careful. And again, I think Pujit is really the man when it comes to understanding this, because Pujit, um, I know we've got a couple of minutes left, uh, but um, would you like to kind of help the audience understand the way we have to treat some of the different types of tables that you get in FNO? Uh, for example, the transaction tables, you know, things like that, yeah. that they need to consider when building integrations, because it's not so straightforward. With CE, the tables are treated in all the same way, but in FNO, yeah. that's not the case. Yes, yeah. Um, that's a very good point. I didn't add that here because it's FNO customization. Never ever use out of the box entities if you want to do the uh, large scale export and import of data. That's mainly because what Microsoft gives this out of the box entities as a guidelines or an advice to um, have the information. So let's look at the complexity of uh, which is involved in an entity. It gets the information from multiple tables. It has a business logic built in. It has a lot of complexity for uh, in an entity. An entity is your only way to get the information out for now. So your end out of the box entities is so complex. It has performance impact on your uh, finance and operation system. Always custom build your entity. A entity which is tailor made for your integration, which is very small, which is not compute extensive. Through that, actually, you will really improve your performance of integration. Um, so I work for very large organizations and people have actually used out of the box entities to do export and import of the data. And we see that the disaster which comes when after a year or two, the organization goes, data grows, and all these exports start failing because it takes too long. So that's because they didn't really think about the integration. So built a custom entity in finance and operation, which is purely tailor-made for integration. Keep it minimalistic in data, remove all the complexity. Uh, what you could do is you could start with um, or for example, purchase order, you want a composite entity which has header and lines. Existing in uh, auditor um, entity. But See whether you need all that information. Okay. Hope that answers the question. Hi, Pooja. That's some very good, interesting uh, points you've mentioned there that are often overlooked for FNO in particular. So very, very good comments. OK, guys, we're towards the end of this really, really good session because um, every system has its own complexity when it comes to integrations yeah. and Pujit, I have to say, is probably one of the leading experts when it comes to the, the integration challenges. Oh, no, that's FNO. not true. There are, um, yeah. Well, I have I, to say, I'm Pujit, not an expert. I just like to share. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you, you definitely I, I, yeah. have, have done a huge contribution. So I just want to say thank you so much, Pujit, for, for all your contributions around this. Um, excellent stuff, Pujit. So um, before we um, wrap up, Pujit, uh, would you like to make any announcements or share any information? I'll just uh, yeah, share my um, blogs. I'm going to write up something for Azure Data Lake. If you're really interested, keep an eye on this because I think this is going to take a lot of pain out of your uh, uh, FNO related yeah, data migration, data export. Exciting stuff. Thank you once again, Pujit. Really, really good. Take care. Good. Thank you, guys. Have a nice day. Thank Cheers. you. Have a great day.